Good morning and good evening to, to everybody. Lovely to Hi. see you all. Hi. <laughs> Lovely that you could join. Um, so we're here today to celebrate the publication of Graham Dixon's marvellous new book, The Master Key to Acting Freedom. And we're really pleased that you could all join us in your different time zones. We're joined today by people, Graham, of course, in Australia, many people in Europe, and we have Patrick at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, Zooming from America. So it's a, an international gathering. And Charles, of course, joining from Canada. So a really great mixture of folks. Hi, everybody. So just to talk you through a little bit what we'll do today, um, I'm going to briefly introduce Graham to those of you who haven't yet met Graham. And then we're going to have a couple of Graham's former students speaking. So we will start with Patrick. And then we're hoping also to be joined by Inigo, who will talk for a little while. And we'll open up with some questions and reflections from those of you who might have perhaps trained with Graham in the past um, and or read the book. So we'll open for reflections or questions um, and comments. So that's the kind of the shape of the whole today. Yeah. So I'm going to begin with a bit of a bio. And those of you who know Graham might already know this, but there may be things you don't know. And some of you may never have yet met uh, Graham. So Graham has involved, been involved with the Michael Chekhov work for 50 years now and has been fortunate enough to both meet and work with many of Chekhov's original students. So a little bit about Graham, he trained in Sydney, Australia, where he studied voice and speech with Alice Crowther. And Alice had been one of the original teachers at Chekhov's uh, studio theatre at Dartington Hall in England. And she traveled back to Australia and Graham was lucky enough to be one of her one of her main students with that kind of Australian tradition of Chekhov technique. Um, Graham then furthered his training in Rudolf Steiner's creative speech method in Switzerland and then in London in the London School of Speech Formation. And this was followed by three years work directing Shakespeare and devising work with young people in Germany. Returning to Australia, he started his own theatre company that many of you will know, Dionysia Productions in 1980. And since then, he's been active, di active directing, teaching, acting, and now writing uh, with his company and outside the company in Australia, the United Kingdom, and in Europe. His company produced works that was based on imagination, devised pieces based on fairy tales, uh, one of which Lorelei still remembers to this day and enacts frequently in the kitchen, and also Shakespeare programmes. Returning to London in the year 2000, Graham founded the Michael Chekhov Studio London, which offers workshops and classes here in the UK and in Europe and occasionally in the USA. He also became a crucial member of the organization Michael Chekhov UK at that time. Like Michael Chekhov, Graham has an interest in the teachings of Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy. I think it's really important to say this morning from a UK perspective that Graham's studio has been really central to the resurgence and the growth of Chekhov technique here in England on this small island over the past 21 years. For example, he taught each of us uh, hosting and speaking today, myself, Tom Cornford, Patrick and Inigo, and he taught all the contributing authors to a new book on Michael Chekhov uh, called Michael Chekhov in the 21st Century, New Pathways. So every single, uh, yeah, I'd like to say young, I'm not sure I'm completely young, but the, the younger generation that are featured in that book, every single one of us has trained and worked with Graham in one way or another and benefited from his mentoring. So I think it's really important to say that and to place Graham in that kind of uh, generous and generative space uh, here on the small island. So I know for myself that reading Graham's book, I'll show you a picture of the cover here, <laughs> uh, really took me back. So it really took me back to training with Graham in the studio um, all those years ago. And I found that the most uh, pleasurable experience actually being kind of transported back in time. It also made me feel a bit wistful uh, and made me wish uh, that I was back in a studio with Graham again. So that's a whistle stop for of Graham. Um, Graham, do you want to say a few words maybe before Patrick and Inigo have a little bit of a, a comment and reflection? Well, yes, um, if that's okay at the moment, I can, you tell me, Cass, if it's too premature to mention how I came to write the book and the form of the book, etc. 
if would you like me to do that now? That would be wonderful. Great. Well, um, the book was inspired. I always wanted to write a book and I didn't have the form. I didn't want it to be um, sort of like a guidebook, exercise one, exercise two. And because I'm not an academic, I didn't feel that I had the academic um, credentials to write that sort of book. And I was in a quandary about the form um, until finally, well, not finally, until in 2014, a young man that I hadn't met before um, wrote me an email thanking me for how I'd helped him. And that's, uh, and I invited him to a workshop and then he sent me another email after the workshop. And I've used those two emails as a prologue and then as an epilogue. So the workshop really is 12 participants and the form is rather like, is there a literary form? I don't know, Tom, maybe you can help me. It's like a novel documentary. <laughs> it's 12 participants with me as the workshop leader, or I call myself the guide, um, written in, in, um, from my perspective. Um, and the 12 participants are all from various backgrounds, actors, um, teachers at universities, dancers, and so on. And one psychologist as well. Um, or is it psychiatrist? I never know the difference between those two words. Um, and so the first uh, three days of the workshop um, are really about um, that master key, which is the connection between one's physical body and one's inner life, what Chekhov called, and maybe the academics can inform me whether that term psychophysical was ever used before. I, you know, Chekhov began to use it well in the 50s when he, he wrote to the actor. Um, so that's the master key. But as we work, we see that it's not just um, the physical body and the inner life that has to be connected um, uh, and it's not a matter of which comes first, it's uh, the chicken or the egg question, either can come first, as we know. But then as, we were wor as we're working, I wanted to develop, working in the workshop, that is, in the, in the book, um, I wanted to extend that um, duality of physical body and inner life in, into, a, into a trinity, in a way, so that third element, um, which in the book I call number three, um, is about the world and everyone in it. And so I go into that in some detail in the book. So it's not just one, it's not just a duality, there's another element added to it as well. Um, the first three days are about those exercises that I developed, which we could call pre chekhov exercises if we wanted a name for it. Because I noticed in my, my work, a lot of young people were coming that didn't have really a um, perspective of um, the, the, the culture and the creativity that Michael Chekhov represented. You know, we could say that European Western civilization um, view of the world. So they needed to catch up in a way because they'd been bombarded by, since they were at birth, television images, cinema images, and now, of course, images are everywhere. And so I introduced what I call the pre check of exercises. So the first three days are really about those exercises which I've developed to launch us into a um, experience of that connection between one and two the soul life and the physical body and how they relate. And then um, into the outer world, because really actors give, it's what they do. And where do they give? They give to an audience and the audience gives to them. So it's that reciprocal arrangement, um, which, is, which I go into quite, quite a detail in the book. It's only the fourth day that we that I actually um, go into a, a check of exercises, which I've called the four relationships to the air, known as molding, floating, um, flying and radiating. And I go into that in great depth. Um, 
And so um, in the second day, third day and fourth day, the students um, participants, I call them, um, have to bring their, their text. And so they work on their text using some of the principles of their choice that they've learned in those, in those four days. And then the characters um, also go through quite, ex quite different experiences. There's a character called Tyler, who's Australian. I don't know why I made him as an Australian, um, who's very doubtful. I mean, he's had a strong um, academic um, training um, in drama. And so it's rather confronting these, um, th this work of Chekhov, um, which is really not, na not rational or intellectual, but one has to come to a degree of another way of thinking, which I call um, pure thinking. And so he's like a devil's advocate. Um, the psychiatrist is quite good because he can actually sort of spout for me um, all sorts of um, psychological stroke, spiritual aspects of the work without me having to sort of you know, be the master teacher on that level. So that's what it is. Thank you, Graham. I think that gives a really nice sort of taste of the structure. Uh, and I know that I, I very much valued that kind of idea of process. And also what I liked about the book is that you were reflecting on your dialogues and your exchanges with these different students uh, over time, some of which I'm sure are inventions and some of which I'm sure are sort of based on, on real people and, and real encounters. And there was something you know, nicely relational about the way that you, that you reflected on that. Thank you. Patrick, just, shall we? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Cass, can I just say one thing? I've yeah. just had a text from Indigo, he's not able to attend. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to inform you of that. Wonderful. Okay, well, shall we hand over to Patrick? I know that other people will have questions and reflections too, but shall I hand over to Patrick now? Um, I know that he has a, a number of reflections about working with you in the past, and I think some words as well from another former participant. Patrick? Yeah, thank you. Good morning evening wherever you are um so um graham and i had talked about me just saying a few words there won't there'll be a few words but deeply heartfelt words as i've been like, reflecting on the let me see graham i think it's now nine years since we first met and worked together if anyone that doesn't know me i don't think there's well there's maybe one or two people that don't know me i'm an actor um, and I came to Graham's classes, or I, I sort of, I always say I accidentally stumbled on the checkoff technique when I'd reached a point where, you know, I was working, but I wasn't really deriving any pleasure from my work. I was feeling very much that I was sort of trotting out the same kind of, you know, I was that I was sort of fooling, <laughs> I was getting by on, on sort of fooling people somehow. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't satisfying. And I, I would say I accidentally went to a workshop here in the States led by a Russian Chekhov teacher called Elena Kuzina and something happened in that class. And then she told me about Graham and I was about to go to London for an extended period. So Graham has been at the center, Graham and Graham's approach and the Chekhov approach has been at the center of my work ever since. Um, it's been a fundamental pillar for me. And uh, Graham, you've put, you've, you've, you've guided me through things in a way that I don't think anybody else has um, since. So um, just to start, I've got a couple of words from Via Doherty, who did the, I don't know, maybe Cash, you can hold it up again. She did the illustrations the front cover there, the mandala, beautiful illustration for the book. So she had sent Graham a reflection, which Graham asked me to read because she can't be here today. So um, I'm just going to read um, half of it. She talked about her process of how she came to um, uh, create that artwork. Um, <clears throat> And she said in preparing that she, she in preparing that work and working on that and and um, kind of 
opening herself to her relationship with her materials that she was going to be working with. She said that she also spent time re recollecting the many hours that she spent in acting workshops with Graham. And she remember, and she says, I'll read in her voice, she says, and I remembered the overarching mood of those magical journeys. It was one of joy and humor, real good fun, her emphasis on the whole. To be sure, there were many challenging moments, but all in the spirit of play. It was this quality that I wanted to capture first and foremost in the illustrations and particularly on the cover. She says, playfulness must be synonymous with the key. So the cover underwent quite a number of personality changes from a gloomy, dark and dreary type to a flaky new agey self-help book type to its final manifest manifestation as a mandala of joy where all qualities and expressions are met with true good natured hospitality. She said she also read and reread the text and welcomed feedback from Graham. So that she says, so that she could venture as close as possible towards Graham's image life with the illustrations. She wanted them to do their true task and that is to illustrate. So um, I really, the first bit that she talks about is actually having just read that out is, is sort of the most important bit. She actually took time to um, receive her materials and to allow things to drop in for her. I mean, this is so much part of what we do, right? So, and then just speaking for myself, um, I was reflecting on these kind of, some aha moments that I'd had in Graham's um, workshops. And the thing that came through for me and dropped in for me <clears throat> was I've done a number of summer intensives with Graham which are two week long and extended workshops where you go in five days a week mornings usually spent time working with tools and um, exercises and then the afternoon spent with people um, a workshop participants getting up one-on-one -on -one to usually work with a little bit of text <clears throat> and I remember I think for me, the real lights really started to go on watching Graham with other students, some of whom weren't actors at all. So I'll, I'll write what I, what I wrote. So working in those works in, with Graham, <clears throat> I'm also very, very mindful of the words I use. And that's something that I get from, I think, from my experience with Graham, is I think say things like working and all of a sudden that sort of gesturally becomes something quite heavy and dense. So um, anyway, we won't worry too much about that at the moment. So um, Graham, you helped me to recognize and appreciate fundamental truths. Life is movement and movement is life. Words, action, what we recognize as human behavior are born out of movement. And one of my main aha moments came as a result of watching you, Graham, work with other people in your kind, soft, patient way. Working with actors, with non-actors, people with experience, people with none of this kind of, of, of people with experience and people without. And you guiding someone, maybe someone use, with somebody using a piece of text and using a simple gesture, perhaps placing or giving each word or line. And in the process, um, becoming completely captivating to watch. They might, they might be working maybe with a nursery rhyme and a simple gesture. And all of a sudden in, in me, the spectator, the audience, um something would happen it's hard to describe even what it was but but you'd see the intellect and the mindful of well-intentioned good ideas give over to the movement that's engendered in the gesture and something else would drop in something greater it's that elusive thing that we look for when we go to the theater that doesn't always happen <laughs> we leave unsatisfied and then there are those times that make us go back where something, again, words, um, something transcendent, 
something that reminds you that you're not alone, something that's a shared experience. And sometimes even the participant who was using the text didn't, wasn't even aware of it themselves, what they were revealing, nuance upon nuance. Graeme, you're a master of that and of facilitating that. And I really, I so look forward, I so, so, so look forward to being in a room with you again. Um, for me, you make the exercises that we do. Um, it's so clear to me that that is, it's to prepare you to be able to um, uh, to be able to have this experience. So you made sense of so much for me, but you also at the same time opened up all these sort of mysteries <laughs> that fascinate me. And uh, anyway, that's it. I wish you all the best with the book. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope I made sense. It is awfully early. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. That was it was really lovely and so nuanced. And I related to so many of the things that you were saying there. I mean, yeah, really important, beautiful comments. And I think some really interesting comments um, by, by the artist who did the illustrations as well. I'm very biased, uh, but for me, because my specialism is, is play, <laughs> play and actor training and play and theatre making and teaching and pedagogy, the, the, the resonance that she was talking about play and playfulness in Graham's work, I think it just, it was one of the most powerful, generous, eye-opening, life-changing moments when I met Graham all those many, many years ago, nearly 20 years ago now. And so for me, that, that also spoke to me very much when she talked about trying to capture that in the illustrations, um, which is really lovely. Um, I'm wondering if we can open out as we're a small group for other people to reflect or to ask questions, to either reflect a little bit on training with Graham or some of the things that Graham has just talked about with the book, um, or, or indeed, if you've read the book and you've got questions about the book or reflections. Yes, Elliot, please. I think you might be still on the mute. I know I keep doing this as well. <laughs> mute. Now you can hear me, yeah? Perfect. Amazing. So yeah, I'm a student of Graham. I mean, I've been a student of Graham for a few years now. It looks like it was, I mean, when we met, it was like yesterday, but it's been already five years. <laughs> Time's flying, it's crazy. Um, Patrick was there actually as well, <laughs> I remember. Um, yeah, so I when I started to work with Graham, I was very young, I was like 19. Uh, well, I'm still young. But <laughs> um, um, and but and I, I relate a lot to, to the actual main character of the book because I did a, a drama school before uh, working with Graham and I have really had this uh, experience of uh, feeling so, feeling that something that, that there was something wrong with with the way they were they were teaching me uh, acting or something was missing. Um, yeah, it was too too much of a practical activity. They, they were, there wasn't enough of a of a feeling of a emotions of not emotions but of, yeah um, listening to yourself and 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 yeah. So I, I when I when I came in the UK to work with Graham I had a lot of question about acting and I wanted to know more and I knew there was something that I didn't get uh, from drama school I and mean, from the way, from where, where I went and um, and uh, when I started to work with Graham at the first workshop I felt I directly feel that, that, that there I was I, I needed more of that <laughs> so we started to work a lot uh, I, I did all the workshops you could I mean I could everything I could do I, I would do it um, lesson with him like one-to-one -one and all that um, and it changed completely my way of working of, of doing acting of my my the way I was perceiving you know the creative process um, and also I mean the main thing I've learned is this ability that you can train yourself to listen to yourself this, this ability to, not, not to yourself sorry to listen uh, the drop-ins something that comes from some somewhere else you don't know where it comes from but and this is an ability it's it's like a, uh, it's a muscle you train and all those things you do with gram is you train that you train this and i think everyone can do it any human um but um the way society work the way school the way we all 
being um how do you say that um taught us even school like uh when, when we were kids the way we the, the relationship we have with life other people uh to grow to improve um this is i i, I change also my my whole way of, of dealing with life of dealing with uh, relationships and everything so it's a, it's a whole it's a holistic work I mean Graham always say that it's a holistic work it, it trained you to do to live like differently um, and definitely I mean I've been going uh, working more in uh, my acting that way and I, I would never go back and and there's so much more to explore so much more to work and yeah I'm looking forward to have as Patrick said some uh, you know, like a proper real life um, experience with Graham again. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, this the, the book I think is amazing. It really um, shows, uh, I mean, make you feel what you feel during a workshop. As you said, Cass, like when I read it, it's like you you feel you're back, you're back there. Like it's, and and, I really enjoy the way it is uh, written as a novel. Like it's a uh, you, you. It's because again, it, it's the same um, thing I was saying about the difference between like a, the way I was taught in drama school and the way I was taught by Graham acting. It's exactly the same thing. Like practical books, where you've got the, all those exercises one after the other. Yeah, okay, you can do that. <laughs> it's fine. But the way Graham um, in in um, put like um all those things inside the novel inside the story uh it's it, it represents well uh how we, how I think, I think acting or any creative work should should be yeah that's brilliant that's brilliant elliot i think that you're really right and so interesting to see the contrasts between graham's approach and what we often are still getting in conservatoire training and i think you're right there's such a profound difference there uh, yeah. you know in terms of his his practices and the way that the book is written one thing i really love in this book which sounds very left of center but i think it connects to what you're saying earlier about being holistic and a different kind of approach is graham talks about the coffee breaks you know mm. why talk about the coffee breaks well the coffee breaks are really important aren't they as these kind of social spaces as spaces of kind of equality and exchange as people are processing things and functioning in a different way and i think that what it does is it sort of extends the notion of pedagogy as this lump like you're saying Elliot. you know you've got to do mm. this this is your exercise this is your book yes. and exactly. it becomes as you say about life and about social social relationships really mm. doesn't it um, so, you know, I love that bit, Graham, uh, that there's, there's a lot of talk about the coffee and the biscuits, which I remember well, but, you know, and, I, and it makes me think that actually by excluding that in some of these acting manuals or these rigid syllabuses, there's something almost a bit dangerous there about disconnecting, mm. um, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know it, oh, there's a message, look. Uh, oh, it's Tom Bostock. Shall I read his message? He says, I have to pop back to work, but it's so lovely to hear you speak, Graham, Patrick, Cass and Elliot. What a nugget of joy this book launch has been. It has given me the biggest smile and I'm filled with many generous memories of working with you, with you Graham, and all of you within this group. Can't wait to read the book. Love to all. So that's a message from, from, from Tom Bostock. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should hand over to the other Tom, Tom, <laughs> Tom Cornford. I'm wondering if you've got some reflections and some comments as well. Yeah, um, I have a couple. Um, I um, I suppose the first one is it really reminds me of um, of all of the um, work that Graham and I did such a long time ago. Now, I mean, we're talking I don't know, ten years ago or something. Maybe I, don't, I mean a very long time. Anyway, um, and of Graham's amazing ability to um, to sort of to kind of think in the architecture of a technique and not sort of through individual exercises but sort of um, to really see the relationship of everything to everything else and sort of think very creatively around within the, that sort of that structure um, and he that was a huge gift he gave to me and I'm really really grateful for it um, uh, the other the other thing I I, ref, I wanted to reflect on in the book is the way that he gives this sort of has these this dramatis personae of different characters in his workshop, and I wondered. Uh, so I have a question I suppose for Graham, which is sort of um, most 
actor training these days is very instrumental. It's very focused on sort of how you're going to get a career. And, you know, we, we're constantly talking about, I mean, we're constantly talking about employability in universities, whatever degree people are doing, but, but in acting, it's very focused on the industry. Um, and there's really not very much focus in this on an acting career at all. There's not, it's not, doesn't seem to be on the agenda, which I think is great. But I just wonder sort of what, why you've brought all of these different characters together and what you think the, the training has to offer them all, regardless of whether or not they're going to do any acting, frankly. Oh, Graham, you're muted. Sorry, one second. There we go. Does that work? Can you hear me? Perfect. <laughs> um, that's a question that I'm still working with because it's a question deeply related to this phrase of Chekhov's um, The Theatre of the Future. Now, within the book, I, I don't poo-poo that idea, but I say I'm more interested in the theatre of now rather than theatre of the future. Um, if you read the book, um, I go into more detail about that. But I think after what we've experienced over the last 18 months and how that's affected, the, the lockdowns have affected well, actually, I still Can you Can you still hear, see me? Or have I gone mute? No, oh, we, we can hear you, Graham, and see you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Everything went a bit black. <laughs> um, everything is now up for grabs. What do we have? We have live theatre all closed down, mostly. Yes? All we have is Netflix and whatever other things are. Um, where the, the future of the, of the actor now to earn money is, is actually within those um, technological um, spheres. Now, the Chekhov technique is really about from beginning to middle to end in a whole performance. And the actor is not able to do that or alter that or change that within cinema or television or whatever other technological means. So they're actually sort of um, not free to um, change their performance, change the direction of their performance in the overall um, huge beginning of the play to the end of the play or the, or the screenplay or whatever. And music plays an extraordinary role now, I noticed. Um, it did so in, in cinema before. If you actually look at some of the old movies, before television, that's sort of like late 40s, early 50s, before television came in, um, music did play an important role. If you can actually turn off the music, turn off the sound and look at the scene, the music plays an extraordinary role and it's even more so, so now. So the actor no longer is, um, can I say, in control of the performance. It's no longer an artistic activity like an artist painting a picture or a composer playing a piece of music um, in concert or um, broadcast. They don't interrupt the first movement. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one whole thing. And so that really, that really worries me. Um, I mentioned it a, a little bit in the book, perhaps too dramatically, perhaps too, I do go on rants in the book, I think. Um, but I'm very anxious that this work that we're doing where the actor is the artist, just like the painter, like the composer, like the musician, uh, I won't, yeah, and the dancer, but the dancer depends on, on, on live performances. Um, where you have that, that intimate relationship with the audience and how the audience affects you and, and how um, you affect the audience. It's a communion between both of them in a live state. I mentioned that in one of the appendices, I think, because Chekhov talks about it a bit in the book. So I'm more and more beginning to 
try and formulate thoughts about that, Tom. Um, I think in the future, theater actors will no longer, these are just thoughts I'm trying to develop. You know, before theater came out of, out of a religious right, out of the um, early um, mystery centers where they actually, um, for the neophyte, certain performances would be um, given to allow the neophyte to experience great cosmic laws and great mysteries of the human being. And I have a feeling that the theater of the future is going to be on that basis. And I think we're living in an age of bifurcation and that we're gonna go in two directions. <laughs> That's already very evident politically, um, on, on not only politically, but on many other levels as well. Um, so I feel that the actor in the future, 20, oh, another century, another two centuries, and the work that we're doing now, developing the, just this, this, this Chekhov work, where the actor becomes, um, and I think I bring, a, a, you know, one of my students um, mentioned this, this balance between the spiritual journey, the individual journey to fulfill themselves as a human being through their work. And I feel that in a couple of centuries, everything will change completely and the actor will be how they're paid, I don't know, that's the big question. But they'll be involved in therapy performances. They'll be involved in um, almost what we would call mystery theater. You know, rather like what Wagner was trying to do with these great operas, particularly Parsifal, where in fact, um, um, communion, you know, the Eucharist is performed on stage in a theatrical performance. Um, so I feel, Tom, yes, I, I haven't addressed that. Um, but at the same time, one mustn't be precious. You know, actors have to earn their money. They have to get whatever job is there um, to practice their art in whatever way it is, whether it be a voiceover, whether it be a commercial, or whether it be a Netflix, whatever, or some sort of um, small theatrical performance. <laughs> Um, or even a big theatrical performance, they have to practice their art. And the only way to develop as an actor is to keep practicing and performing. Mm. You know, someone said to me, Dennis Glenny, who worked with Michael Chekhov, I mentioned him in the book in the appendix, how important he was to me, mm. um, as well as Alice Crowther, that, um, that the actor is able to, um, to practice and practice and he said, I've become a workshop junkie. Just don't do workshops. Get out there and, and get actors together and do performances, even if they're in the living room. Yeah, that's most important. Um, and I feel that somehow live theatre is going to depend on um, your, your locality. Just start something and where, where, whatever venue you use, it must be live, yeah. And there's an overabundance now in theatre, particularly what I call factory theatre. And even in sort of straight theatre on the West End when I was living there, um, I do plan to go back, of course, <clears throat> not to the West End, but to London. Um, uh, everything was dependent upon, and I could see now that microphones were being introduced. I mean, it is in musicals. Um, and also great amounts of technology and things. I remember visiting a, a participant of mine years ago. He was in, is it Wizard? Is that's what it's called? That musical? Wicked. Wicked. There we go. Not Wizard. It's about a wizard, but it's called Wicked. <laughs> and uh, he had a lead role and he was so frustrated in it because he had no control of his performances. All the lighting cues were on computer. So if he wanted to extend the scene by another five seconds, mm -hmm. holding something, resonating, radiating, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in that sense, he was not an, a master of his work. He couldn't um, uh, adapt to what the audience wants, as Chekhov mentions when he was performing. He could, he could, he could sense who was in the audience and he would work on that level. 
So I feel, Tom, it's an indirect way to answer your question, but I think that's, that they're the areas I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. I think um, we're going to have a bifurcation within the acting world. Um, those that really want to to um, combine the esoteric, their, their esoteric life, their spiritual life, um, their spiritual exercises with the, their um, exoteric profession. And I'm always, have always been amazed, and that's why I got into Chekhov, I think, and in a way Steiner as well, that there's a deep connection between your, your um, esoteric exercises, no longer sitting, meditating um, in, a, in a white room, but actually the exercises themselves are meditative exercises. We're building skills, we're building muscles, as, she, as Patrick mentioned. Um, so I, I feel it's going to be very interesting the next um, 25 years. I won't be here at the end of that 25 years, but I hopefully the seeds that, that I've tried to put in the book, um, and there's another one coming as well that I want to write, uh, extending further than the master key to acting training and to, into all the other areas like improvisation, text work, speech work, vocal work as well, um, which is sadly missing. Yeah. Um, however, that's we're living in this time and we accept these challenges, but nevertheless, we have to keep on having great um, images um, of what the, this theatre of the future will be and how we build, build that for those actors that are going to be manifested and incarnating again. And so it's something is there for them. That's beautiful, so Graham. It's, it, it, these are really lovely comments in terms of questioning where, where theatre and performance might be going, but also repositioning mm. the agency of the actor. And I think that's wonderful about the work that you do. How do we give the actor the agency? As Chekhov said, the actor is the theatre. You know, and you're saying, exactly. you know, the master key to acting freedom, you know, freedom. So it's a really lovely end and some really interesting thoughts about what we do do in the here and the now and what we might, what we might possibly do in the future. So that feels like a really quite a beautiful um, conclusion. And you've mentioned the book again and mentioned that another book will follow, which is exciting. So I'm wondering if I can be a little bit of your advertising agent here and just say again, the book um, in the chat, Tom Cornford will put the link if you haven't already seen it or you might like to check it out. So the link is there in the chat so that you can follow through to have a look. Um, at the book. Um, I'm conscious that we've overrun a little bit, but it's been such a rich um, and enjoyable sort of dialogue and exchange. Um, so Graham, I'll, I'll hand back uh, just briefly to you to say, you know, thank you and bye-bye. And thank you so much to Tom Cornford as well for also supporting and Patrick as well for, for his help in this event. Um, but huge congratulations to Graham. Shall we, give a, shall we give a handshake before I hand over to Graham to say goodbye? <laughs> This is quite a nice bit of Zoom, isn't it? That we get to gesture a lot on Zoom. So Graham, yes, exactly. thank mm. you so much. That's, it's been a really, a really beautiful morning. Thank you so much, Cass. Thank you so much. Wonderful.